Okay, guys. Hi. My name's Sam. I work in the healthcare education sector, uh, specifically around one healthcare issue in particular that often gets overlooked. It can affect any one of us, actually, at any time. And it's expected that this year it will cause the death of more people than tuberculosis, more people than HIV and AIDS, more people than malaria. Indeed, the World Health Organization said that in 2010, this issue would be responsible for more loss of life than all three of those headline public health issues combined. And yet we have the power to recognize its signs and symptoms. We actually have the power to treat it. And even without being qualified academics or senior healthcare professionals, we can teach others how to treat it and how to recognize it as well. Now, whether you survive this particular healthcare issue can be a matter of the severity of the case. But more often than not, it comes down to where you live and how the people around you react. Isn't that incredible? We're now losing nearly 5.8 million people every year through injuries. Now, some through complex trauma, yes, but more still from simple, treatable incidences which need not lead to loss of life. So, when we talk about equality in emergencies, do we simply mean the rich West compared to low-income countries? Well, not quite. You see, it's true, I do work for an organization called First Aid Africa, and in one of the countries that we work, over 100,000 people every year will die because of lack of access to basic first aid. But that country looks like this. This is not a developing world problem. This is not a low-income country problem. This is my home country of the United Kingdom. And it's true that equality and survival rates after an injury is definitely affected by the affluence of your society, and there's a significant injustice in that fact alone. After all, you don't have to be a socialist to believe that we all deserve a fighting chance in an emergency. But even in the UK, where the state spends over $225 billion every year on healthcare and education, we still don't educate our children in the basic principles of emergency healthcare. So, if we understand the scale of the problem, what can we do to change things? Does equality have to mean uniformity? Well, I would suggest that in this case, we're now in a position where even with the best ambulance response times in the world, even with free access to healthcare for every citizen, we are still losing our men, women and children because of a lack of access to basic first aid. And so, whatever solutions we're looking at cannot simply be north and south. They cannot simply be rich west as opposed to low income. We have to look for broader solutions here. And by the end of this few minutes that we've got together today, I'm hoping that we're going to be able to discuss a few of those options. Now, I need to start by confronting perhaps uh, the elephant in the room. Why would a young person at the age of 25 go around the world speaking to different classrooms, university groups, colleges about a subject as obscure as first aid? And we'll come on to that in our personal section in just a second. But we need to start by stressing the importance of empathy. You see, empathy is very different from pity because it requires us to relate to the subject on a very personal level. You know, many have argued that without dehumanization, that war could not occur that we need to see others as subhuman before we're prepared to reject any guilt that we have about their loss of life due to the actions of our society. Simply put, loss of empathy leads to loss of life. So it remains open to debate, but surely if dehumanization is a path to accepting violence, then empathy itself might be a catalyst for peace. And if not peace, then perhaps at least understanding, or maybe humanization, which is what today's is all about. Because dehumanization doesn't just occur in wartime propaganda. It takes place all around us. We're desensitized by mass statistics on a 24-hour news cycle, so much so that we see death in terms of numbers instead of in terms of humanity. Now, you may have seen that statistic before and thought, that's quite interesting, 5.8 million, that is quite shocking, yes. But how many people have the cognitive ability to understand what that 5.8 million people must actually mean? 5.8 million brothers, sisters, mothers, fathers. Take yourself back to your own home, your own family, and then consider that. 
Consider the size of the largest football stadium that you can imagine and times it by itself. And we're talking about the level of loss of life through injury. This is its own standalone healthcare issue and we need to treat it as such. You see, when we're given these impressions of areas that are low income, it's really easy for us to simply think of it under a single narrative. As Chimamanda Adichie, the Nigerian author said, we see countries and even continents as single stories. And that's absolutely true. And if I wanted to give an example of a good quote around humanitarian issues about equality and emergency, I could quite easily quote Shakespeare and say, you know, if you prick me, do I not bleed? It's a very famous quote. We all understand what he's getting at. But I'd like to quote a friend of mine from Malawi. She's a healthcare professional there. And she said simply, just because we know the statistics on child mortality here, do you think it hurts a mother any less than in your, than in your country when she loses her child? Does she cry different tears? Doesn't she live with the same sense of loss? You know, for any humanitarian action to succeed, we need to promote empathy above pity. And we'll be coming back to that idea in a few moments' time. You know, I said I'd mention the personal. I have a very acute understanding of what it's like to go through an emergency trauma. At the age of 16, uh, I suffered a head injury. I ended up in a coma. And the best that Western healthcare could provide was given to me for free in the United Kingdom. And qualified medical professionals, some of the best doctors and nurses around, worked around the clock to try and save me. And during my recovery, I realized how fortunate I was, yes, but also the importance of good emergency care. Now, I went on to complete qualifications with the Red Cross and with the UK's Royal Life Saving Society and others. But the simple fact is we should not have to go through such a near miss in order to understand the importance of good emergency care. So if any of you in the future have the opportunity to take some kind of course, whether you learn cardiopulmonary resuscitation, the recovery position, how to treat burns, how to treat a major bleed, fractures, take it, take that opportunity and practice because you probably won't be given a heads up when you're about to need to use it. You know, when an accident happens, there's this incredible rush of adrenaline when you realize that you know how to help, you know how to support someone, how to save a life, and it is absolutely incredible. And anyone in a medical professional with a first aid background will tell you, it's almost indescribable, but consider the alternative. Can you imagine a loved one collapsing in front of you and not knowing what to do? Seeing life fade and wishing that you just learned that CPR thing that you saw on TV. It's horrible, isn't it? So do learn and do practice. I said we'd come on to equality and emergency and the notion that in different parts of the world there will be different solutions. And I'd like to give a couple of examples and look at some solutions from low-income countries and what we can learn from them. You know, one part of my job is I'm privileged enough to work with some amazing healthcare professionals and friends from many different countries who show me some brilliant local solutions for emergency care problems. Some of them we integrate into our syllabus for wider dissemination. Others are simply too interesting not to look into a little bit more. So as a quick disclaimer before I show you one of these examples, I want to be really honest about where my NGO came from. Because I think it's really important, as we'll see in a video in a few moments' time, that NGOs acknowledge when they make mistakes. You see, when my NGO first started, we took out Western equipment. And it was gratefully received, lots of first aid boxes in lots of rural areas, and it was terrific, and everyone said, thank you so much. And two things happened then. They were either put in cupboards, lest they ever be used up, or they were used up. And the kicker is, it wasn't even the best equipment available. The best equipment available was right on our back doorstep, and we didn't even realize it. But some brilliant local first aid trainers did realize it. And working with colleagues from around the world, they came up with some terrific solutions that we're now able to disseminate a little bit wider. And I'm going to show you, if I may, one of these examples. I've got a bandage here. It's the same as you get in most Western first aid kits. It costs around $2. You can probably find one or two of them on the university campus here. 
Two dollars. Prohibitively expensive for a subsistence farmer earning a dollar a day. So does that mean we should send out hundreds of Western first aid kits to the most rural parts of sub-Saharan Africa and developing countries and low-income countries? Is that what we should do? Well, actually, the answer was a lot closer to home. And this was a solution that cost 17 pence. One-tenth of the price. This is a strip of material that I bought three days ago on the outskirts of a city called Kisumu in Kenya. It cost me around seven pence. Off-cut from a tailor's. This is a sanitary towel. And these are incredible. Let me tell you why. It's almost as if these were made to be a solution for bandaging issues. Gentlemen, you might be about to get an education. <laughs> if I take off the side, we've got wings on the side of it, which we can attach round. We don't even need to buy any tape. And I can attach the other side like this. And I've made myself a 17 pence bandage. One tenth of the price of the bandage we were about to spend our donors' money on to send out to sub-Saharan Africa. <laughs> Think of the carbon footprint alone for sending that many kids out. And it's right there on people's back doorsteps. But you know, this is not the only solution. I will leave that up there just for a second so folks can take it in. The translations are in Swahili on the side. But just one of the solutions has been made available. This is a locally sustainable first aid kit. There is nothing in this kit which costs more than a dollar. From the carry sheets that you see on the side, which are made out of local material in order to transport someone to hospital, to the bandages that we've just seen made there on the right-hand side as well. And it can all be locally sourced. You see, this is what we can learn from. Equality is not uniformity. Equality doesn't mean homogeny. As long as we use evidence-based practice, we can attain similar results by different methods in different areas. So if we're willing and able to act, what is it that's stopping us? And if we all have the ability to save a life, why are more people dying from injuries than ever before? Well, with all public health issues, there are logistical barriers to overcome. But actually, we have some pretty good reports now from various academic organizations and various large institutions on how to implement public health policy, but it's still not being utilized Simple fact is, there are so, so many top-down projects which don't succeed simply because they don't engage with the local organizations or with the grassroots community at a very personal level for a thousand different reasons. And similarly, there are lots of small-scale community action projects which try their best and do have considerable success on the ground, but then when they scale up, are simply unable to. This is called the nutcracker effect, and it was mentioned in the United Nations Commission on the Social Determinants of Health. And I think it's a brilliant model, and something that anyone working in the humanitarian sector needs to consider. We cannot simply go out there in our mass participation, grassroots projects, and ignore the policy makers and the decision makers. But similarly, for those of us that work at a top level, at a very senior level, perhaps government to government with bilateral links or multilateral links, perhaps the larger organizations, you cannot simply ignore the grassroots movements as well. Because when both of them work together, we're in a much stronger position to crack that nut of health equity. And I think that's perhaps why now most organizations accept that when we promote facilitation over direct influence, we're often more likely to be able to support those who truly aspire to change their communities for the better. And believe me, as someone who comes from a student-led organization, full of idealists, myself included, that's a tough lesson to learn. But it's so important that we do. Because although I've always rejected the notion that idealism and youth are synonymous with naivety, humanizing the world should never ever mean imposing our own ideals on others. One of the reasons why events like this are so powerful is that they allow a young person who's passionate about his or her subject to sound on the same stage as senior experts in their field. So what are our hopes for the future? And perhaps more importantly, are they realistically possible? Well, it's never been a popular message from any charity, but I believe that we can do more. I believe that there's a lot of opportunities that we're missing. We can go out there and work with more partners. We can engage with more people on a broader term. 
and we can disseminate more information like the solutions that we just saw before. But I don't believe that any of us can humanize the world until we see other people as more than simply human. We have the power to save life and we have the power to take life, but we're so much more than that. We know that humanizing the world should never mean imposing our own ideals on others, but if there is a singular way to find a meaning of humanizing the world, then perhaps to find it, we need to enter into dialogue with others and those outside of the communities that we would normally go and speak to. To step outside of our comfort zone, to discuss the things we love, to be able to find similarities that we would have otherwise never known exist, but more importantly, to see the folly of our differences so that they no longer can intimidate us and prevent us from working together. To be able to enjoy each other at our best so that we might be able to help each other at our most vulnerable. So this is all great rhetoric, but what can we do in this room? Well, there are three layers here. For those of you that have the contacts at the top level, for those of you that are able to lobby government at a direct level, I want you to do two things. Firstly, ensure that there is a good Samaritan law in every country. Good Samaritan law means that people can act in an emergency without the fear of le legal repercussions. And if you remove that barrier, the propensity to act increases tenfold. Secondly, if we teach our children not only that they have right to life, but that they have the right to save lives as well, we will be in a much stronger position in society. Teaching young people first aid does work, and it should be on every national curriculum. And the fact that we spend $225 billion a year in the UK on healthcare and education, and that we don't include it, is entirely unfair on those young people who do want to learn. For those of you with grassroots projects, community organizations, NGOs, consider pre-hospital care. It's terrific if you're able to build a clinic. It is brilliant if you're able to go out to an area that perhaps didn't before have a surgeon and train one surgeon. That is so important. But there are so many people who don't even make it to those clinics. And they're dying on the way through simple things like loss of blood going into shock. These are things that we can teach through pre-hospital care, and there are local solutions. And finally, to everyone, as I said before, you will not be told when you're about to need to use your emergency skills. So learn some basic first aid and practice it. You know, I believe in three things. I believe the people in my country die because of a lack of ba access to basic first aid. I believe it's possible for governments and NGOs and aid agencies to make rural accident prevention and treatment a priority because people are dying on the way to the clinics. But more than anything, I believe in the power of humanity to act in an emergency. Thank you.